open high interest, low hassle accounts and negotiate fees like an Indian last week, you got your credit cards organized, and now in week 2 we're going to get your bank accounts set up right. Since they're the backbone of your personal finance infrastructure, we're going to spend a little time picking the right ones, optimizing them, and making sure you're not paying unnecessary fees. The good news is that this can be done in just a few hours over the next week, and once you do it, your accounts will basically run themselves. The bad news is that the bank account you have probably from your neighborhood big bank is most likely a big fat rip-off with fees and minimums that you don't need to be paying. See, banks love young people because we're new to banking, and they think we don't know any better about things like monthly fees and overdraft protection. With this chapter, that's going to change. I'll show you how to pick the best bank and the best accounts so you can earn the maximum amount of interest. How Banks Rake It In Fundamentally, banks earn money by lending the money you deposit to other people. For example, if you deposit $1,000, a big bank will pay you 0.5% to hold onto that money, and then they'll turn around and lend it out at 7% for a home loan. Assuming that everyone repays the full amount they're loaned, the bank makes a 14 times return on their money for simple arbitrage. To be fair, banks don't get 100% of their principal plus interest back, so they do incur some risk and should be compensated accordingly. But 14 times is a lot of money. To me, this is a lot like a lazy Godzilla outsourcing a city's destruction to the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man while he sits around and eats a big old pizza, then takes a nap. Fees, fees, fees. Banks also make money from fees a lot of money. In 2006, banks made more than $10 billion from overdraft fees alone. For example, if you're using a debit card and accidentally buy something for more money than you have in your checking account, you'd expect your bank to decline the charge, right? Nope. They'll let the transaction go through, and then they'll helpfully charge you around $30 for an overdraft fee. Even worse, banks can charge you multiple overdraft fees in one day, leading to horror stories of more than $100 in fees levied in a single day. But there are some positives. Bank of America is nice enough to see charge you only $20 for the first overdraft, but $35 for each subsequent overdraft. What a great deal. Check out Bank of America's Ridiculous Fees and Processes site, which offers full-screen video and thousands of words but, crucially, does not actually tell you the amount they charge. No more overdrafts. One overdraft fee at your crappy neighborhood bank wipes out your interest for the entire year and makes you hate your bank even more than you already do, if that's even possible. More than half the people I've spoken to during my personal finance talks have had at least one overdraft. One night back in college, I was out for dinner and my friend Elizabeth started asking me questions about overdrafts. They got increasingly complex, which weirded me out because I wondered how she knew so much about them. I thought I was the only nerd who read up on overdraft fees for fun. Then I asked her a simple question, how many overdrafts have you had? She suddenly got quiet, which forced me to interrogate her like Mike Wallace. I ended up learning that. She'd incurred more than $400 in overdraft fees over four years of college by simply not paying attention to how much money she had in her account. I screamed at her so much. The sad thing is that she could have negotiated her way out of the first few and then set up a system so that it never happened again. For more on negotiating bank fees, see page 65. Remember, your bank's fees are often more important than the interest rate it offers, if you have $1,000 and another bank has a 1% higher interest rate, that's a difference of $10 per year. Just one overdraft fee equals three times that amount. Costs matter. I'm going to admit my bias up front, I'm a big fan of online banks like Indirect and Emigrant Direct because they offer simple banking with great rewards and almost no downsides. Most important, they don't try to nickel and dime you with fee after fee. These online banks have realized that by eliminating overhead, they can offer dramatically higher interest rates and better customer service than the traditional big banks.
Online banks have no branches and no tellers and spend very little on marketing, which allows them to accept lower profit margins than conventional banks. That savings is passed on to you as lower fees and higher interest rates. I also love the fact that online banks cut off problem customers. Indirect, for instance, has found that once customers' balances rise above $600,000, they tend to start demanding a higher level of service than Indirect is built for. They want to keep costs low for everyone else, so if these high-value account holders require too much service, Indirect gently suggests that they move to another bank. Man, it takes some balls to tell your highest rollers to take a walk. This is the opposite of brick-and-mortar banks, who love to upsell products to their high-balance customers. The result is that online high-interest savings accounts offer interest rates about 6 to 10 times higher than you'd get at your neighborhood bank. That's right, for the first time in history you can actually make a decent return by simply parking your money in an online savings account. Plus, up to $100,000 held in a savings account is insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, which is basically the government. That amount was temporarily raised to $250,000 until 2010, but may change. Even in the mother of all crises, politicians will move heaven and earth to protect ordinary American savings. It would be political suicide not to. Here's the funny thing, try to get your parents to open one of these high-interest accounts, and they'll stop and stare at you like you just backhanded grandma at the family picnic. Online banks are scary for older people. Especially after a few name brand banks failed during the credit crisis. A number of people I know actually withdrew their money and kept it just in case in their houses. I didn't know whether to scream at them or rob them. Fortunately, you and I are comfortable doing business online, so we can take advantage of the higher interest rates. The nuts and bolts now that I've got my bank rants out of the way, Let's go over a few account basics. You may think you know all this stuff, and a lot of it you probably do, but bear with me. Checking accounts as you know, checking accounts let you deposit money and withdraw money using debit cards, checks, and online transfers. I think of my checking account like an email inbox, all my money goes in my checking account, and then I regularly filter it out to appropriate accounts, like savings and investing, using automatic transfers. I pay most of my bills through my credit card, but occasionally there are bills that I can't pay with my card like rent or my car payment that I pay directly from my checking account using automatic transfers. In Chapter 5, I'll show you how to make these transfers and bill paying work automatically. Traditionally, banks paid no interest on checking accounts, but this is changing. Most online banks now offer checking accounts with interest, blurring the line between checking and savings accounts. Checking accounts are the number one place where unnecessary fees are levied, which we're going to fix. How much you earn at online banks vs big banks. Savings accounts think of savings accounts as places for short term, one month, to midterm savings, five years. You want to use your savings account to save up for things like a vacation, Christmas gifts, or even longer term items like a wedding or down payment on a house. The key difference between checking accounts and savings account is this, savings accounts pay interest, although, as we saw, the lines are being blurred with new interest bearing checking accounts. Typically, big banks paid about 0.5% interest on savings accounts, meaning that if you put $1,000 in a savings account, you'd earn $0.41 cents in monthly interest, or $5 per year. I find more than $5 in pennies on my way to the bathroom each morning, so I'm not very impressed by that kind of return. Interestingly, if your money were sitting in one of these banks, like Wells Fargo or Bank of America, you'd actually be losing money every day because inflation is about 3%. That's right you may be earning 0.5% interest on your savings account, but you're losing 2.5% every year in terms of real purchasing power. The most important practical difference between checking accounts and savings accounts is that you withdraw money regularly from your checking account but you rarely withdraw from your savings account, 
or at least that's the way it should be. Checking accounts are built for frequent withdrawals, they have debit cards and ATMs for your convenience. But your savings account is really a goals account, where every dollar is assigned to a specific item you're saving up for. Most people keep their savings account and checking account bank, although this is increasingly changing as electronic transfers become the industry standard. In fact, with electronic transfers and online banks, options have gotten considerably better for consumers. Online banks pay a higher interest rate for savings accounts about 2.5 to 5%. Would produce $25 to $50 interest per year on that $1,000, compared with $5 per year on the big bank savings account. And as with any savings account, your money just keeps growing and compounding, meaning it is working for you by just sitting there. There is one downside to having an online savings account, it can take a few business days to access your money. Typically, if you want to withdraw your money, you'll log into your online savings account, initiate a free transfer to your checking account, and then wait 3 to 5 days for it to happen. If you need your money immediately, this could cause a problem but then again, you shouldn't be withdrawing very frequently from your savings account, so most likely this won't be a big issue. To see how much you'd make from an online bank versus a big, bad, bank, plug in your own numbers using the online spreadsheet at my website, I will teach you Taberic.com. Why you need both a savings account and a checking account having your money in two separate accounts makes money management easy. One basic way of looking at it is that your savings account is where you deposit money, whereas your checking account is where you withdraw money. Yet there's something profoundly different about having two accounts, if your friends want to go out on Friday night, you're not going to say, hold on, guys, I need three business days to transfer money to my checking account. If you don't have the money available in your discretionary, checking, account because you've spent your going out money, you're staying in that night. Having a separate savings account forces you to keep your long-term goals in mind instead of just blowing them off to have a few rounds of drinks. Right now, you might be saying to yourself, why should I bother with a savings account? I only have $300. I hear this all the time. It's true, the interest you'll be earning on that kind of money isn't really that much. How my bank accounts work it's not easy being me. Just as the paparazzi follow Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan, wanting to know what they're wearing and which clubs they're going to, people are always dying to know about my personal finance infrastructure. My accounts. All of my money goes through my interest-bearing Schwab online checking account. Deposits happen through direct deposit and by mailing checks in pre-addressed, press-tamped Schwab envelopes. I have a brick and mortar Wells Fargo checking account because it was required to open my savings account and I haven't gotten around to closing it. But in general, once you've opened the online account, you can close your brick and mortar account anytime. My system. My finances work on a monthly cycle, and my system automatically disperses money where it needs to go. I've set up accounts to draw from my checking account. For example, my Ing Direct Savings account automatically withdraws a certain amount every month from my checking account, as does my investment account, more about these in Chapter 3. For consumer protection, I pay my bills using my credit card. The credit card is automatically paid in full every month by my online checking account. For cash expenses, I use the Schwab ATM card to withdraw money at any ATM nationwide. All ATM charges are fully reimbursed at the end of the month. Generally, I use my Ing Direct account as a receiver, not a sender, I rarely transfer money out of there unless I need to cover a temporary shortage in my checking account or want to spend savings money on something important, like a vacation or birthday gift. And that's how I do it. But it's not just about your immediate earnings being young is about developing the right habits. We're cutting our teeth with small amounts of money, but as our savings accounts increase from $5,000 and $10,000 to $100,000 to $1 million, the habits really start to matter. Start small now so that when you do have a lot of money, you'll know what to do with it. 
Finding the perfect account setup I wish I could suggest the one best checking and savings account for everyone, but each person is different. Don't worry, I'm not going to cop out and hold back my bank recommendations. I'll give you my favorite accounts in a few pages. Before you go about finding the specific banks and accounts you want to use, take a minute to consider the bigger picture of how you want to organize your accounts. I'll take you through simple and advanced setups for your checking and savings accounts, but pick the one that works well with your personality. You have to know yourself, do you value simplicity? Or are you the kind of person who wants to spend your time building a complicated system for a slightly larger payout? For most people, the second option dash basic option plus small optimization is perfect. Most basic option, good for lazy people. This is the bare minimum. All you need is a checking account and a savings account at any local bank. Even if you already have these accounts, it's worth talking to your bank to be sure you're not paying fees. Basic option plus small optimization, recommended for most people. This option means opening accounts at two separate institutions, a no-fee checking account at your local bank and a high-yield online savings account. With the checking account, you'll have immediate access to your money and the ability to transfer cash to your high-interest online savings account for free. If you already have this, great. Just call to make sure you're not paying unnecessary fees. Note, most online banks require you to have a brick-and-mortar bank, so don't close your old account before checking with your online bank. Advanced setup plus full optimization, perfect for people who read things like lifehacker.com and the 4-hour work week. This setup consists of several checking accounts and savings accounts at different banks, usually to eke out the most interest and services that various banks have to offer. For example, I have a basic checking account at a brick and mortar bank, an interest bearing checking account at an online bank, and a savings account at yet another online bank. Although you can set up automatic online transfers, having multiple banks means multiple websites, multiple customer service numbers, and multiple passwords. Some people find this overly complicated if you're one of them, stick to one of the more basic setups, unless it's very important to you to fully optimize your bank accounts. So many choices, so little time depending on what accounts you already have and what setup you've opted to go with, getting this part of your financial infrastructure squared away may be as easy as making small changes to accounts you've had for a while. Or you may need to open new accounts, which can be pretty overwhelming. Imagine walking into a strip club in Vegas where you can see everyone lined up and take your pick. I am really hesitant to go further into this analogy because my mom is going to read this book, but suffice it to say that both strippers and banks want your money. Also, there are a lot of choices. That's all, mom. As usual with financial decisions, we have too many options, leading most of us to make less than ideal choices like opening a bank account in college and then staying with that bank forever. There are some good accounts out there, but of course banks don't always make these deals easy to find. Why use a credit union over a bank? I'm a big fan of credit unions. Credit unions are like local banks, but they're not for profit and are owned by their customers, or, in credit union parlance, members. As a result, credit unions usually provide better loan rates and more personalized service than other brick and mortar banks. Most are wide open to the public for you to establish a checking account, savings account, or loan although some require membership in associations like teachers' unions. When you're looking for a car loan or home loan, you'll of course compare rates online, but be sure to also check out your local credit union at www.creditunion.coop.cu locator. Full disclosure, I've SPO conferences to help them understand how to reach young people, which I love doing because I hope they succeed in reaching out to other 20-somethings, at a number of their national most traditional banks offer different checking and savings accounts to serve customers with different needs and amounts of money. They start at student accounts, which are bare-bones accounts with no fees, no minimums, and few value-added services. These are usually perfect for young people. Next, 
they offer accounts that have nominal monthly fees around $3 to $5. They also offer ways for you to get these fees waived, like using direct deposit, where your paycheck is automatically sent to your bank every month, or maintaining a minimum balance. If your employer offers direct deposit, these accounts might be a good choice. Finally, banks offer higher end accounts with higher minimums often $5,000 or $10,000 and more services like commission-free brokerage trades, which you should avoid, since banks charge exorbitant fees for investments, bonus interest rates, and discounts on home loans. These accounts are worthless. Avoid them. If you have that much money lying around, I'll show you how to put it to work in Chapter 7 and earn more than any bank could give you. You should research the options at a few different banks. I suggest calling, or even going in, and asking them if they can help you find a no-fee, no-minimum account. Ideally they'll be able to offer you a few options. Remember, even if the accounts have fees or minimums, ask about ways, like direct deposit, to get them waived. Here are some phone numbers to get you started, Bank of America, 800-432-1000 Chase, 877-682-4273 Citibank, 800-374-9700 Washington Mutual, 800-788-7000 Wells Fargo, 800-869-3557 Emigrant Direct Online Savings Account, 800 836 1997 HSBC Direct, 888 404 4050 Ing Direct Orange Savings, 800 464 3473. Beyond just the type of accounts offered, there's more to consider when choosing your bank. S. I look for three things trust, convenience, and features. Five shiny marketing tactics banks use to trick you. One teaser rates. 6% for the first two months. Your first two months don't matter. You want to pick a good bank that you can stick with for years one that offers overall great service, not a promo rate that will earn you only $25, or, more likely, $3. Banks that offer teaser rates are, by definition, to be avoided. Two requiring minimum balances to get free services like checking and bill paying. 3 upsells to expensive accounts, expedited customer service. Wow! Most of these value-added accounts are designed to charge you for worthless services. 4 holding out by telling you that the no-fee, no-minimum accounts aren't available anymore. They are. Banks will resist giving you a no-fee, no-minimum account at first, but if you're firm, they'll give you the account you want. If they don't, threaten to go to another bank. If they still don't, walk out and find one that will. There are many, many choices and it's a buyer's market. 5. Bundling a credit card with your bank account. If you didn't walk in specifically wanting the bank credit card, don't get it. Trust. For years, I've had a Wells Fargo account because their ATMs are convenient, but I don't trust big banks anymore. I'm not the only one. At the moment, Big banks are looking around wildly, wondering why young people like me are moving to high-interest accounts online. Perhaps it's because big banks pay a meager 0.5% interest, and they try to nickel and dime us for every small service. Perhaps it's because they secretly insert fees, like the filthy double charges for using another ATM, then count on our inaction to make money off us. There are still some good banks out there, though. The best way to find one is to ask friends if they have a bank they love. You should also browse the major bank websites. Within about 5 minutes, you should be able to tell which banks are trustworthy and which are not by seeing how straightforward they are with their accounts and fees. Your bank shouldn't nickel and dime you through minimums and fees. It should have a website with clear descriptions of different services, an easy setup process, and 24-7 customer service available by phone. Another thing, ask them if they send you promotional material every damn week. I don't want more junk mail. Stop sending crap, a couple of years ago, 
I switched my car insurance because they would not stop sending me mail three times a week. Go to hell, 21st century insurance. Convenience. If your bank isn't convenient, it doesn't matter how much interest you're earning you're not going to use it. Since a bank is the first line of defense in managing your money, it needs to be easy to put money in, get money out, and transfer money around. This means its website has to work, and you need to be able to get help when you need it whether by email or phone. Don't be a rate chaser. Do me a favor, if your bank account offers 3% and another bank starts offering 3.1%, don't change accounts. Half the time, those rates are simply introductory teaser rates that will drop I'd rather take a slightly lower interest rate if it's at a bank I can trust to give me great service over the long term. But there are a lot of dorks who spend every waking hour online digging up the best interest rate and switching to it immediately. OMG, they say. Emigrant Direct increased its rate from 2.25% to 2.75%. Now it's 0.02% higher than Ing Direct. I must switch accounts right away. Onward. If you do this, you are a moron. Do you really want to spend each month figuring out which bank is offering a slightly better rate? That's a colossal waste of time for most of us, since a 0.5% difference equals just a few dollars per month more in interest. Plus, interest rates change over time, so rate chasing doesn't even make sense. I plan on sticking with my bank for the next few decades, and I'm sure you have better things to do with your time. So focus on the big problems, not on rate jumping. 6 months. My bank's website is terrible. It's horrible most of it isn't in plain English, and they seem to think that everyone should speak like a stock trader. Even worse, it obfuscates how much you actually have versus how much you owe, and doesn't give you streamlined access to moving things around. For example, on a recent charge I made, I can see it online but I can't pay it. I will have to call them and authorize them to pay it. How messed up is that? Eleanor P. 25. Features. The bank's interest rate should be competitive. If it's an online bank, it should offer value-added services like prepaid envelopes for depositing money and convenient customer service. Transferring money around should be easy and free because you'll be doing a lot of it, and you should have free bill paying. It's nice if the bank lets you categorize your spending and get images of cancelled checks, but these aren't necessary. The best accounts. As we've seen, there's a lot that goes into finding the right accounts. Here are a few specific options that I've found work well for many people, checking accounts your local bank or credit union's checking account with no fees and no minimums. Yes, I hate big banks, but their checking accounts are usually the most convenient ones available. As we just discussed, you can get no fee and no minimum accounts with student accounts, direct deposit, or negotiation. Bill paying and new checks are generally free with some concession, such as a minimum amount in the account or direct deposit. These accounts pay little or no interest, but because you won't be storing much money here, that's no big deal. Using the criteria I laid out on the last few pages, you should be able to find a local bank or credit union that you'll be happy with. Schwab Bank Investor Checking with Schwab One Brokerage Account www.schwab.com slash public slash schwab slash home slash account type slash brokerage slash schwab one with ic.html or just google it if you've decided an online checking account is right for you schwab offers a stunningly good account with three to five percent interest on money in your checking account no fees no minimums no fee overdraft protection free bill pay free checks an ATM card, automatic transfers, and unlimited reimbursement of any ATM usage. Deposit money by transfer, direct deposit, or mailing in checks. When I saw this account, I wanted to marry it. Although you need to open a Schwab brokerage account to get all fees waived, you don't have to use it if you have another discount brokerage account. See Chapter 3 for more on brokerage accounts. Overall, it's a fantastic checking account. Ing Direct Electric Orange, 
http colon slash slash home dot indirect dot com slash products products asp this online checking account has many benefits it can be tightly integrated with indirect savings accounts and it provides an atm card free atm access at 32000 all point atms but surcharges for usage at other atms automatic overdraft protection easy bill pay and a simple interface build as a paperless account there are no personal checks to use you issue checks electronically through your account or transfer money outbound you can deposit money by transfer direct deposit or mailing in checks the only reason I don't absolutely love this account is the fact that only some ATM withdrawals are free which means you'll have to look up which ATMs you can withdraw from or face fees savings accounts I would not encourage anyone to use a standard big bank savings account online savings accounts let you earn dramatically more interest with lower hassle and because you'll primarily be sending money there not withdrawing it what does it matter if it takes three days to get your money http colon slash slash home dot indirect dot com slash products products dot asp i use indirect for my online savings account this excellent bank lets you keep virtual sub accounts which means you can specify savings goals like a car, wedding, and so on, and set up automatic transfers to other accounts, transfer $100 on the first of every month from my checking account and send $20 to my investment account on the fifth of every month. You can use this in conjunction with an indirect checking account, and there are no fees, no minimums, and no tricky upsells or annoying promotions. It's not always the highest interest rate, but it's always close. Ing Direct Orange Savings Emigrant Direct, https colon slash slash emigrantdirect.com Another great bank that a bunch of my friends use. Their account generally has the highest or second highest interest rates available. HSBC Direct, www.hsbcdirect.com Also highly recommended. Like Emigrant Direct, HSBC generally has the highest or second highest interest rates available. Now you've got all the information you need to open a new checking or savings account. It shouldn't take more than 3 hours of research and 2 hours to open each account and fund it. Get it done. Optimizing your bank accounts whether they're accounts you just opened or already had, you need to optimize your checking and savings accounts. This means you shouldn't be paying fees or minimums. The key to optimizing an account is talking to an actual customer service rep, either in person or on the phone. Yes, nerds, you have to get out of your chair and either go over to the bank or pick up the telephone. For some reason, half my friends are afraid of talking to people on the phone and it ends up costing them lots of money. I have a friend who recently lost his bank password and, for security reasons, had to call the bank to prove who he was. He turned into a Stockholm Syndrome victim in front of my eyes, muttering, it's not that important. I'll just wait until I go into the bank over and over. He didn't get his password for four months. What the hell is wrong with people? You may not like to talk on the phone, but most of the special deals I'll show you how to get require talking to someone in person or on the phone. So suck it up. Avoiding monthly fee maybe I'm too demanding, but if I'm lending a bank my money to relend out, I don't believe I should have to pay them additional fees. Think about it, if your big bank charges you a $5 monthly fee, that basically wipes out any interest you earn. This is why I'm fanatical about my savings and checking accounts having no fees of any kind, including monthly fees, overdraft fees, or setup fees. If you already have an account at a bank you like, but they're charging a monthly fee, try to get them to waive it. They will often you set up direct deposit, which lets your employer deposit your paycheck directly into your account every month. Alert to students if you're a student, there's no reason you shouldn't have an account with no fees and no minimums. If you decide to stick with a big bank account, make sure you're in a student account with no annual fees. Here's how the conversation will probably go, you, hi. I'm a student and I'd like to get a savings account and a checking account with no annual fees. I'd like free checking and no minimum balance, please. Banker, I'm really sorry, 
but we don't offer those anymore. You, really? That's interesting because Bank of America slash Wells Fargo slash Washington Mutual slash other competitor is offering me that exact deal right now. Could you check again and tell me which comparable accounts you offer? 80% of the time, you'll get a great account at this point. If not, ask for a supervisor. Supervisor, hi, how can I help you? You, repeat argument from the beginning. If the supervisor doesn't give you an option, add this. Look, I've been a customer for X years and I want to find a way to make this work. Plus, I know that your customer acquisition cost is more than $200. What can you do to help me stay a customer? Supervisor, what an astounding coincidence. My computer is suddenly allowing me to offer the exact account you asked for. You, why, thank you. Kind sir. Sip Darjeeling Tea. You're in a customer group that's very profitable for banks, Ing Direct and the American Bankers Association put the cost of acquiring a new customer between $100 and $3,500 including all of their advertising, personnel, and technology costs. They don't want to lose you over something as small as a $5 monthly fee. Use this knowledge as leverage whenever you contact any financial company. Banks will also try to trick you by demanding minimums, which refer to minimum amounts you must have in your account to avoid fees or to get free services like bill pay. These are BS imagine if a bank required you to keep $1,000 sitting in its low interest account. You could be earning 20 times that much by investing it. If you can't do direct deposit because your job doesn't offer it or if you can't get the bank to waive a minimum, I strongly recommend that you switch to an online high interest account, which has no fees and no minimums. Note, certain charges are okay for services like money orders and reordering checks. Please don't run into your bank screaming, but Rumit told me no fees, when you're trying to order more checks. That would be cool, though. Almost all bank fees are negotiable the most painful and expensive fees are usually overdraft fees which is the fee your bank charges you if you don't have enough money in your checking account to cover a purchase. Of course, the best way to avoid overdraft fees is to not let them happen in the first place. Set up automatic transfers and keep a cash cushion in your account, I keep about $1000 in my checking at all times. But mistakes do happen. Most banks understand that people are occasionally forgetful and they'll waive a first time fee if you ask. After the first time, it gets harder but can still be done if you have a good excuse. Remember, they want to keep you as their customer. A well executed phone call can often make a difference. But when calling, keep in mind that you should have a clear goal, to get your fee erased, and should not make it easy for companies to say no to you. Here's how I negotiated my way out of a $20 overdraft fee and a $27.10 finance charge from Wells Fargo. I had transferred money from my savings account to my checking account to cover a temporary shortage, and the transfer arrived one day late. I saw the overdraft fee, sighed, and called the bank to get it waived. Rumit, hi, I just saw this bank charge for overdrafting and I'd like to have it waived. Bank rep. I see that fee, hmm. Let me just see here. Unfortunately, sir, we're not able to waive that fee. It was some BS excuse about how it's not waivable. Bad things to say here, are you sure? Don't make it easy for the rep to say no to your request. Is there anything else I can do? Again, imagine if you were a customer service rep and someone said this. It would make your life easier to just say no. As a customer, don't make it easy for companies to say no. Well, this Indian blogger dude told me I could. Nobody cares. But it would be cool if a thousand customers called their banks and said this. Okay. Don't give up here. Despite what you learned in sex ed, no does not mean no when it comes from a bank. Try this instead, Rumit, well. I see the fee here and I'd really like to get it waived. What else can you do to help me? Repeat your complaint and ask them how to constructively fix it. At this point, 
about 85% of people will get their fees refunded. I have hundreds of comments from people on my blog who have taken this advice and saved thousands of dollars in fees. But in case the rep is obstinate, here's what you can do. Bank rep, I'm sorry, sir, we can't refund that fee. Rummit, I understand it's difficult, but take a look at my history. I've been a customer for more than three years, and I'd like to keep the relationship going. Now, I'd like to get this waived it was a mistake and it won't happen again. What can you do to help? Bank rep, hmm, one second, please. I see that you're a really good customer. I'm going to check with my supervisor. Can you hold for a second? Being a long-term customer increases your value to them, which is one reason you want to pick a bank you can stick with for the long term. And the fact that you didn't back down at the first no makes you different from 99% of other customers. Bank rep, sir, I was able to check with my supervisor and waive the fee. Is there anything else I can help you with today? That's all I had to do. This doesn't just work for overdraft fees it can also work for certain processing fees, late fees, and even ATM fees. I learned this lesson the hard way. I lived in New York for a summer when I was doing an internship. I decided not to open a bank account while I was there because it would take time and I was lazy. So I just used those ATMs left and right and ate the $3 charges, $1.50 from my bank, $1.50 from the ATM, each time. Now I feel dumb because I just talked to a friend who recently moved to New York for a few months. She didn't want to open a bank account for such a short time either, but instead of just shrugging and saying oh, well, she actually called her bank. She just asked them if they would waive the ATM fees while she was there. No problem, they said. She saved more than $250 just by making a phone call. Remember, with a customer acquisition cost of more than $200, banks want to keep you as their customer. So use this information to your advantage, and next time you see any fees levied on your account, make the call. While many bank fees are ridiculous, I find that they are quite willing to wipe them for a good customer. I had a bounced check fee wiped because I stupidly wrote a check out of the wrong account. I simply walked into the bank and asked, and they did it right there on the spot. I didn't have to do any convincing or anything. Plus, I'd been a customer for about 5 years. Adam Ferguson, 22 Action Steps Week 2 1. Open a checking account or assess the one you already have, 1 hour. Find an account that works for you, call the bank, or go in, and open the account. If you've already got one, make absolutely sure it is a no-fee, no-minimum account. How? Review your last bank statement or, if you don't have that, Call your bank and say, I'd like to confirm that my bank account has no fees and no minimums whatsoever. Can you confirm that? If you discover you've been paying fees, use the negotiating tactic on page 64 to get your account switched to a no fee, no minimum account. Be aggressive in threatening to leave if they don't switch you. If you decide to switch, check out www.bankswitcher.com. 2. Open an online high-interest savings account, 3 hours. You'll earn more in interest and pay less in fees. Plus, it's psychologically powerful to have your savings account separate from your checking, you're much less likely to dip into your savings if it's not immediately reachable through your normal banking. Spend a couple of hours comparing the banks I recommended on page 61. To see a more comprehensive list, got to www.bankrate.com. My favorite savings account, Ing Direct. 2. Optional, open an online checking account, 2 hours. This isn't absolutely necessary but if you're ready to be more advanced and earn a higher interest rate, go ahead and do it. Remember, the main benefits of an online checking account are a high interest rate and fewer tricky fees. My favorite checking account, Schwab Investor Checking. 3. Fund your online savings account, 1 hour. Leave one and a half months of living expenses in your checking account, or as close to it as you can manage. 
This prevents overdrafts as you're getting used to transferring money between accounts. Remember, most transfers take 3 to 5 business days. Transfer the rest to your savings account even if it's only $20. Congratulations! Now that you've got the backbone of your